if something's wrong, I want to try and put, put it right. I want to do my bit to put it right. And I don't think that's unique to me. I think everybody has that sort of capacity in them, but it just needs to be brought out. And where does that come from? I really don't believe this wonderful, beautiful thing called um, human existence is just going to come to an end with climate change, and it is going to come to an end. If we don't do something about it, that's it. It's extinction. Or as one writer put it, unite or perish. But someone would counter, well, we live in a democracy, we vote for the government. One vote every five years is not living in a democracy. Not in any way, shape or form. That's all we're given. What is the thing that you feel people get wrong or misunderstand most about you? Don't be fooled by this charming, lovely person underneath their steel. Delia, lovely to see you. Nice to see you guys. Welcome to the show. What is high performance to you? Well, it, it's something that um, I wouldn't pertain to, really. It sounds a bit above <laughs> what I do. But I think it's um, doing the best you can do and really um, not leaving any stones unturned, going the extra mile and working really hard. Um, that's it for me. I love the idea of growth and change. And many people look at Delia Smith and think Delia Smith, chef, cookery writer, football club owner. You released a book not long ago that was very different to the Delia Smith that we all know. What made you want to do that? I, I just think um, it's been a journey that started when I was a child, really. And I just felt um, I've, I felt there's something wrong in life um, that might be able to be put right. And I think um, what we've neglected is our, our sort of deeper selves, our spiritual life. And I think it's got bound up with religion that. So it's sort of put on the side as being religious or about religion. So I desperately wanted to do um, something about the spiritual side of life, spirituality, um, that didn't include religion that it, you know, it wasn't about religion. It's about humans and what humans are made of. And I thought it was a, a beautiful book, Dina. I said it to you off air. I thought that you, that you Matter really is a powerful book. I'm interested in that comment that you said that you'd almost recognise that something wasn't right from, yes. from a young age. Would you tell us more about that? Well, not so much from from when I was young, but now, which compelled me to write it. But... I just felt um, because uh, when I was a child, my mother put me to bed too early and I knew it was too early because all the kids were outside playing and there I was, no chance of going to sleep. But I just had this space, this time in my life, which was very productive. I can't explain it any more than that. But every child has, you would know, uh, Damien, the child... All children have their sort of space moments when they're dreaming or they're, you know. And I just felt that was an important part of life that I've always wanted to always go back to, you know. So that's what, you know, that's what sort of brought it on, if you like. So it was almost like constructive daydreaming. Yeah, anything. I mean, I don't like the word meditation because I think it implies something you've got to achieve, something you've got to do. But I think stillness and silence um, achieves so much in a person. And I just wanted to try and convince people that it's very therapeutic, you know, that you come out of the, the busyness and the fast lane and you just have that time in yourself to, yes, daydream or whatever comes along. Sometimes it's going to be something really deep. Sometimes it isn't. Sometimes the shopping list at Sainsbury's <laughs> comes into the mind or what I'm going to have for breakfast or whatever. But it's something really ordinary, but something really dynamic at the same time. Spirituality. What does it represent to you when we say spirituality? Well, it means that there is um, 
the essence of a person, the deeper side of a person that can get lost in the noise and the activity. Um, there's one great philosopher, French philosopher, whose name I can never remember. And all through this podcast, I'm going to be saying I can't remember whoever's <laughs> name it was. So we'll get that over with. But he said, all the troubles in the world, not some, all the troubles in the world come upon us because we refuse to sit still in our rooms for half an hour each day. And do you do that? Yes. <laughs> and what does it do for you? I can't say what it does, but it's something I can't do without. You know, I need to have that space. I need to have that time. So interesting. So for people that don't do this, how should they begin? Is it as simple as just sitting still for half an hour or are there specific things that you, that you that work for you that people could maybe adopt well i've always said the harder it is the more you need it yeah. so i had a book that i that helped me written by an indian sufi who said um it is going to be hard but if you do 10 minutes and then increase it later to 20 minutes and then increase it to he said the optimum is an hour a day um, I think that is a good way. And I think, you know, being a practical person, I think it's quite good if you have a timer so you know when the 10 minutes is up. Because if you're not used to it, you sit there and you go, keep looking at your watch. It's, oh, is that all? Mm. <laughs> People are not used to sitting still and silent, so it's quite difficult. But as somebody that has a packed agenda and has had a packed agenda for a long time, whether it's with the football or yeah. with the other commitments and, and initiatives that you're involved in, Delia. What does this half an hour reflection give you in, the, in, in, in those other worlds? It's just opened me up um, to a more intense kind of view of things, um, of people. It's only in the last 23 years that I've made the commitment to do an hour a day. Before that, it was just dribs and drabs. And, okay. But that was reading the book. You know, this guy was very emphatic. Yeah, I think it's changed me completely. And it's made me more um, aware. It's nothing airy-fairy or right up there. It's... But but can you give us a, a specific example of a level of, of cuz it's given you like you say this intense awareness mm -hmm. can you give us an example of what that looks like in... well it isn't anything I, I think i might have used the wrong words there it's something really simple like noticing people okay. um listening to people um appreciating life appreciating other human beings I think probably what's blown me away is what human life is. I can't, I can't actually still quite believe it, you know? Go on, say more about that. Well, we don't choose it, do we? We're just there. There's some sort of, uh, I don't know, cosmic process that's going on in this vast universe where it takes millions of years for light to reach the Earth, and that's how big it is. And there's this tiny little planet, which is like in, I know you're going to be interviewing Brian Cox later, <laughs> but it's like a little dot, you know, tiny little fragment in within all that. And up pops life. I mean, come on. What's that? Life happens. And it's all life. And then it's human life. So it's life everywhere, you know, little blade of grass coming up that's life and then it's human life and ah, oh, there's culture and there's sport and there's all these wonderful things and i know it's difficult i know it's hard but it's still awesome and what does that mindset do for you when things aren't great or you're faced with challenge or you find life difficult as a lot of people do it is going to always be difficult so I like old-fashioned colloquialisms, so there's no such thing as a free lunch. <laughs> and everything is going to cost, everything is going to be hard sometimes, everything is going to be disappointing. Um, and I would say, with both of you, to both of you, how wonderful football is. 
because a little child of five sitting on the terraces in tears and the whistle's just gone and they've lost knows what life is about. There are going to be those, you know, you lose the match and it's the end of the world. And is that maybe why football actually is so important to you? Because it's about human beings. It's about yeah. human connection. It's about community. It's about yeah. Especially coming together the and connecting. Especially the connection and the community, because there aren't many areas of life now where there's still proper community. And community is where people become themselves. People become their best when they're in community. When they're w with other people, that's when they rise up and become truly themselves. I've learned a lot from you, Damien. Oh, well, thanks, Damien. <laughs> you, Damien talks about social glue. Mm. Explain uh, your thoughts on that. Social glue. There is this kind of invisible connection that we all have that we can ignore. We don't realise it's there. But when you get, you know people together and when they become team you know that is quite that is it isn't it it's finding as you said that social glue so where have you seen it applied most powerfully then wherever there is community where there wherever there is strong community i mean i had somebody write to me the other day and ask me to to say a few words and she was in norfolk helping poor families you know to cope and she said, it's amazing how when you give people, you give them freedom, when they come together and you give them freedom, up come the ideas, up comes the sort of, you know, imagination and the, it's all there. But I think it needs other people to bring it out. And do you think we've lost sight of actually how powerful we can be when we're together? I think so, yes. I do think so. I mean, um, that's where the power is. I mean, if everybody in the world today got the social glue, got together and said, we're having no more um, authoritarianism, we wouldn't have any. <laughs> and how does this link back to where we started this conversation about, as Damien mentioned, reflective daydreaming, that hour a day that you take yes, just to be with yourself? How do we link that to people being together? Because that that feels like a very individual thing to be doing. Yes. Well, I think that's an important part of it because I think what that does is it, is it somehow brings that into you. It, it sort of community, people become more important to you because you're, because you're spending that time. Truth is coming to you. <laughs> And truth is that I can be a better person if I'm with other people. So if I said to you, what's your purpose? How would you answer that question? My purpose? No one's ever asked me that. I don't know what my purpose is, but um, I know how I feel. I feel um, that if something's wrong, I want to try and put put it right I want to do my bit to put it right and I don't think that's unique to me I think everybody has that sort of capacity in them but it just needs to be brought out and there may well be people listening to this thinking we've never lived in a time of more fractious things going on we've never lived in a time where people are more separate from each other despite the fact that it's claimed that technology brings us closer together yeah um that's that's the challenge that people might think well this problem is too great for me to solve or for us to solve or for you know quiet reflection the world isn't rainbows kittens and candy floss is it that you know that there's some that we need some realism here and i think some people might doubt that this can that this can offer that sort of the most dangerous thing of all is that the state we're in at the moment becomes normalised. So we're not expecting, you know, we look on the television and we see the terrible, terrible things going on mm. and the, the killing and the hardship and all of that and we think we can't do anything about it. We feel helpless and we can't do anything about it. So I think we've got to find answers, but I can't find answers, but I think 
together we can find answers. So if I was to go out now and say I was to invite both of you and I was to invite the man who wrote that book and the man who wrote that book and da-da-da-da-da and get them all around the table, right, how are we going to fix it? We would. See, I think what, like, what you're offering here is really compelling, Delia, and I'm interested in... For anyone listening to this, say that whether it's a school community or whether it's just a, a wider community in their local area or whether it's even a business. I get the reflective daydreaming starts to open you up to the truth. What would you say is almost like the next steps of how we can start to create these powerful communities where 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 we start to right the wrongs and make a difference? Well, am I allowed to dream now? Yeah, please, okay. go on. I'll dream by by doing it, by making communities. So I, what's step one of that? Step one of that is um, there is something now, I don't know whether you've heard about it, but there's something now called citizens' assemblies. You haven't heard about it. You see, that's the problem. You know, we've got the media telling us all the time how terrible everything is. Nobody's heard of citizens' assemblies. So what citizens' assemblies are is gathering people together from a community and sitting down and thrashing out what the world's problems are and trying to find the answers. So um, it's now happening all over the world in all different countries. Okay. Um, and um, there is uh, two big societies in America. But the leading light on this is Ireland, the Republic of Ireland. And they started having citizens' assemblies. And um, when they got to this uh, dreaded thing called abortion, which had taken 25 years, the government couldn't sort it. The government could not sort it. So the government allowed, they got a citizens' assembly of 100 people. And what happens is they're all randomly chosen. So they're randomly chosen uh, from you know, electoral roles, whatever, you know, different ages, yeah. different backgrounds. And these hundred people meet together, sometimes over a weekend, sometimes one day of a weekend, you know, a Saturday. or, a, And they deliberate together. Now, what they're given is it's totally random. You can't take a friend or anything. You just go along. And what they're given then is information about the subject to read they have speakers that come in. They have people who have been affected by the law. They come in and talk. So they're informed. They're not deliberating just out of, like, bump, but they're informed. And so they take that information, they get together, and they deliberate, they discuss it, and then at the end, they <laughs> go out to the country they find what they think. They go out to the country. Everybody has a vote. And they change the constitution. Wow. Oh. Now, that's a big one, isn't it? That one. Yep. That is what I'm saying. Now, put that around the world everywhere. Split us all up into areas where we can have citizens' assemblies. And one of the uh, great writers on this was an American writer called Hannah Arendt. And she's written a lot about this kind of thing. I think that's the answer. So I'm allowed to dream on this podcast. Absolutely. What I love on that is that like, if we sort of break it down into transferable bits, that there's something around, first of all, coming up with a solution rather than just identifying the problem. There's something around the diversity of members. Yeah. There's something about listening rather than just having an opinion. Yes. There's lots of yeah. easy skills that anyone listening to this could adopt. Yeah. So if you went onto YouTube <laughs> yeah. and you had a look at the Irish Citizens' Assemblies, what you would see is what I've tried to write about in my book, which is probably not happening is happening to people. They are coming alive. They are beginning to... I mean, there's, there's witnesses that stand up, like a young girl stands up and says, I just had no idea that I could contribute to something like this. Wow. And that's the power of community, of human beings, social glue. 
Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I love most about you, and there are many of them, is your optimism. <laughs> but we're also faced with the media, right? Yeah. Who are deciding that we should be told about all the really awful things in the world. Yeah. And you can watch the news every single night and you can see all the horrendous things and none of us have ever heard about the example you've just spoken about, right? So are you optimistic about the future or are you pessimistic about the future because of the way that society is is informed? Well, I have to be I have to be optimistic about it because um I really do believe it and I really don't believe this wonderful beautiful thing called um human existence is just going to come to an end with climate change and it is going to come to an end. If we don't do something about it, that's it. It's extinction. Or as one writer put it, unite or perish. So how have we lost <laughs> You like that? I love that a lot. <laughs> unite or perish. Yeah. That's how it is. Have we lost sight then of how awesome we actually are? I know that we have. You know, in your book, you people talk about self actualization, realizing the potential that we have yeah. of human beings. Yeah, but we're being brainwashed all the time not to think that. Why? Uh, uh, because I think um, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to get political. Is that Let's all right? Do. Yeah. Is it allowed? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Everything is allowed here. I think that um, what what happened in the Second World War. What happened with Nazism and fascism didn't... We defeated the Nazis, but Nazism didn't go. And now it's moved into another phase called populism. And that populism um, is a lie because the word populism implies people. <laughs> and... Uh, they're not about people at all. So all over the world, you've got these oligarchs and whatever you call them, you know, authoritarian leaders, um, manipulating. They're getting into the political systems of everywhere. So everywhere they're into the political systems and you find evidence of it. So really, um, I think... The only fight back is, the only fight back is people. Somebody else said, but I don't know who said this, which is lovely. Um, the only way to fight populism is the population. <laughs> Do you mind if we touch on that just for a moment? Yes. What's broken and what should the answer be? I think um, what's wrong in the world at the moment is the people the population, the citizens of the universe do not have a say in anything. Nothing. We're just told, you know, okay, we're going to send the refugees off to Rwanda. Uh, we have no say in that. Mm. And I want us to learn about people power and what that would mean. And okay, it is utopian. You know, people will scoff, you know, the cynicism everywhere. It is utopian. Well, let's have a bit of utopia, you know? <laughs> Do you think that people realise they don't have a say? Probably, probably not, really. We just get used to it. We get, um, one writer said, um, we don't know that we don't know. Yeah. That's quite profound, isn't it? Yes. We don't know that we don't know. <laughs> but someone would counter, well, we live in a democracy, we've vote for the government based on their manifesto. Therefore, we do have a say. What would your answer to that be? One vote every five years is not living in a democracy. Not in any way, shape or form. That's all we're given. We have no say in anything else. And what does that vote give us? One set for another set of inadequates. What would you like the answer to be? We have to find a way to let the people in community be the politics. How do we do that? By, by people coming together. You know, one writer, the one I talked about in America, said there should be big spaces everywhere. You know, you should build big spaces where people can come together and deliberate, just like the original. The original, where the word democracy came from, was from the Greek polis. But we have big spaces where people come together and when they come together, they get dispersed by the police and they pass new bills making it illegal to get together yeah. and share your opinion. Or they walk down the street 
telling people not to be using their cars and the media vilify those people. So it then suddenly seems okay for the general public to attack them for doing that or to boo them for caring about the environment. Because the people don't have any power. But if you if you begin to transfer the power to the people, like in the Republic of Ireland, they've now had um, a citizens' assembly on drug abuse, a citizens' assembly on um, the problem of the ageing population. You know, it's the em embryo is there, and I would like to see that developed, but it needs really clever people. I mean, we are really clever. The human race... You know, it's walking on the moon. We're now going to go to Mars. And then here we are, you know, on our little planet, ruining it mm. and making it, you know, wiping it out. And it feels like the wrong people are leading the world as well. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Absolutely. They're promoting the wrong yeah. type of people, yeah. Yeah. perhaps. Do you think that? It's absolutely that. Absolutely that. You know, it's all top down, isn't it? It's all top down leadership. And then we've got the extreme people everywhere dotted about. And um, I, I just feel we are capable of doing anything. Why are we not capable of making our world a place of peace and harmony? And is the biggest challenge here that this is about control? The people who are already in control would never relinquish control to allow the people to take control. Well... It's the other way around. If if the people begin to, I would say, you know, if that thing ha if that thing grows, then sooner or later, you know, it's the people themselves who are decide making the decisions. And I can be blown away by cynics, but we need clever people. I'm not clever enough to work out how that would happen. But all I know now is like. It has, I mean, in America, the founding fathers of America, that was their original vision, was that everybody would be involved. And they were all involved in the resolution, revolution. But then the founding fathers at the end of it, all the people went away and now we're in charge. And then it gets handed on, yep. handed on. And so it's everywhere. It's a few people in charge of a lot of people. When you put it that way, it doesn't seem right. It isn't. It isn't. But it needs clever people who are very clever at writing about what's wrong to say, come on, let's put it right. But we can, we can do it. We are humanity. Look what we've achieved. There is no reason why we can't do it. Obviously, when you talk in this way, yeah. there will be some people that decide to be critical. You know, people, people expect Delia to be a, yeah. a certain type of person. How would you, or would you explain to our audience how you, how you deal with criticism? Well, all my life, you know, I've had quite a lot of criticism, so I've had quite a lot of practice <laughs> <laughs> because um, I used to be slammed for being boring and not, you know, not being a sort of ambitious chef doing, making everybody gasp when they ate something, you know, I was just doing the Yorkshire puddings and the... <laughs> And so I got a lot of criticism for that. I still get a lot of criticism. I think now I'm sure of my ground. I am 82 after all. I've had a long, a long, long time to get to this stage. But I'm quite sure of my ground. And I understand that people won't agree with me. I mean, you know, if I just stood up now and said, look, you've got to close the House of Commons, it's not working. <laughs> I would get quite a bit of criticism. Yeah. And for those who still struggle with with criticism, what advice would you give to them? To be self-actualised, to accept yourself. Um, and I think um, if you can get rid of your ego, <laughs> I think ego is something that we have to grapple with. And if we can get rid of that... Um, and learn how to be humble, then you can cope with it, I think, better. Tell us more about that. Um, Why is the ego so dangerous? I've just watched it over my career happen to people. You know, they, they go up in the world and then they suddenly become 
you know, um, it's I, me and myself, isn't it? And it's, um, I think, a person who, who, who can't say, who can't ever say they're wrong. So if you're struggling with um, criticism, people criticising you, go with it. <laughs> go with the flow. Okay, right, I've got that wrong, you know? What if there's a sense of injustice, though? I mean, I'll give you a, a real-world example. It's pained me many occasions when I've gone to Norwich, knowing the love you have for that club, the love you have for the fans, <laughs> how perilous the future of Norwich was when you bought it, <laughs> the sacrifices you've made financially and personally to hold the football club in the right way the fact you don't call yourself an owner you call yourself a you know the current custodian of norwich the fact you're a fan before you're a majority shareholder yeah i've heard tens of thousands of people chanting dealia out in the stadium yeah so how do you deal with it like a real truth about actually how that feels when it when it feels so unjust i think i think in the beginning in the very beginning, um, it did hurt. Mm. Um, but I think the way to deal with it is to is to just accept it. I mean, um, I know when I close my eyes at night and go to bed, I've done everything I could ever possibly do for Norwich City Football Club. There isn't anything more I could do. And therefore, I know that. I know that's what I do. And I have supporters coming up to me all the time saying don't take any notice Delia don't take any notice you know yeah, but it's you not them though isn't it in the firing line it's different but um, I'll tell you how I dealt with one mm. and it's such a wonderful thing I can't tell you how wonderful I felt I was walking down Carroll Road and we just lost and it was years ago I had to go early because I was doing a television program the next day I had to leave early we were losing badly so Carrow was empty and there's this supporter coming up and he came up to me right up close and he said you have brought our football club into the gutter and all I can say to you is will you please go wow answer well I still love you <laughs> <laughs> and what was the reaction the stewards were all rushing, saying, you all right, Delia? Do you need any help? You know, did you mean it's that? so wonderful. Did you mean that? Yeah, I did mean it. It's so wonderful to be able to deal with it in a humble way because it disarms people. It so disarms them. Kill them with kindness. But when I do get upset, very upset, if I hear people slagging off somebody else that I love, mm. Then I get really upset. That hurts me. Like who? Recently, the supporters were doing a bit of a chant that I didn't like. And it wasn't about me. Right. About someone else on the board or... Why does that hurt you so much more? Because I know, I know the work that goes into a football club, how hard it is and daily toil and the work that goes into it. I love the supporters and... I think that 90% of them understand it. I'm sure. But there's these 10% of whingers. So they're all, in a, they're all in a space now. They're 10% of whingers. Okay. They just whinge on. I'm, I'm, I'm really intrigued to sort of explore the topic of humility with you. Yes. Because I've never met anyone that's, that has had their first name coined as a, in the Oxford English Dictionary or right. anyone that's sold hundreds of millions of books like you have. So I've been lucky. I've, I'm exceptionally lucky. But that's the humility lucky. that we're talking about. When we start, before we recorded, he said, I don't know what I've got to offer here. That's that humility that's integral to you. Yes. But I'm interested in to, how do you maintain that? Because you said you've identified people who as their star has risen, they've almost lost that humility and it's cost them. But this is something that's innate and natural to you and I'm interested in where it comes from and how you maintain it. I, I don't know, really. I mean, I think, I don't think anyone achieves anything without a lot of other people. So I think my parents brought me up. They were always quite critical. Right. And um, my mother, who, who only died about two years ago, was always really critical. So I, I, 
I had this sort of, you know, there was no chance, really. <laughs> in what context would she be critical? Oh, in every, in every single way. Um, there would be this, you know, this criticism. And then I met my agent, who has been my agent for 50 years, and she was really good, you know, at keeping me keeping my feet on the ground, people would be coming in with offers and she'd saying, you don't need that. You don't need to do that, you okay. know. Um, and I think she was a huge help to me. My husband's been a huge help to me. Melanie sitting outside has been a great help to me and other people. I think you nobody does anything, achieves anything without a lot of other people being involved. But again, that humility can sometimes be rare to recognize it people love the idea of the self-made narrative of i put myself up by bootstraps and that sort of story is common in our culture and yet you're willingly acknowledging the community and the people around you yes and i'm interested if you'll tell us about how you've maintained that community and that culture to allow you to stay grounded well by the help i've had of from other people um if you really are humble there's always going to be a bit of ego there it's never going to go complete so be lurking around yeah <laughs> but i i don't know i just have to say how lucky i am i'm really lucky you know i'm lucky that i had debbie my agent i don't she really did help me a lot how did you meet because again that's like your parents yeah. you're blessed with but yeah. you've chosen debbie you know i went to see her so if you can imagine now you know, I would like to go and tell the Houses of Parliament to pack up and go home, all right? How unlikely is that? So I go and see this literary agent, you know, and I'm working in a restaurant um, saying, you know, I'd like to write a cookery book on 18th century English cooking. You know, it's the same thing. And she said, oh, right, you know, and she believed, she believed in me. She just believed in me. And she went to her boss because she was working in an agency. He said, oh, don't touch cookery writers. You know, you'll never get, you'll never earn any money out of a cookery writer. Don't worry about that. And so she, we never got a book published, but she just rang up a magazine one day that was looking for a cookery writer and said, can I send someone? And she sent me and I got the job. So that's how it happened. So what did she see in you? Have you ever asked her, like, why did she believe in something, like you say, and I want to write a book on 18th century cookery? I don't know. I've heard her say one thing about me. The one thing she said, don't be fooled by this charming, lovely, uh, then young person underneath their steel, she'd say. That's fascinating. <laughs> I'd like to touch on that okay. because we can talk about the how humble you are we can talk about your humility but you also are the majority shareholder of a football club and decisions need to be made right mm -hmm. in places like that so let's talk about the steel underneath how do you know when you need to tell someone actually what needs to happen with great difficulty really yeah with great difficulty i don't think i'm very good at that at all not at all so therefore i rely on the team <laughs> and not on me personally. So how would you say you've created or built the culture at, at Norwich City, for example? It's a community thing. I think it was a great football club before I went, when we were just sitting in our season ticket seats. Yeah. It was a great football club, you know. It, there was something very special about it. But I think we have, Michael and I, and he's, you know, 50% of this, we have tried to create an ethos that is a family club, that is um, in the community. But then there's been a lot of other people as well who have who've helped us along the way. But you can't do this without, at times, taking risk. I'd love to find out your relationship with risk. For those that don't know, would you just explain actually how perilous Norwich City's life was when you became the majority shareholders or when you invested Yes. For the very first time. Yes, I can. Um, we were asked to be board directors because it was on the brink of uh, bankruptcy. Right. But how close? Like There were people sharing jobs. You know, they had two people for one job that shared it. And they were about to t take off the electricity and the... And there was a chairman, bless him, 
who just marched around the city trying to get some money. And I'm glad he went to the city because you never get any money out of Norfolk. That's one thing I found out. Oh, so have I. <laughs> you found yeah. that out too. So, um, and then in desperation, he came to us and he said, you know, um, to me, because then I was selling cookery books, he said, um, if, if you would be able to put a million pounds in, um, then you could have a seat on the board. Not that I knew what a board was, but um, I immediately said Michael was the football expert, not me. I was the Johnny come lately who went with Michael, you right. know. So I said, well, if we gave you two million, could we have two seats on the board? And they said, yes. And that's how it happened. And so we spent the first few years sitting around a board table discussing how to service debt. It was that bad. How to service debt, how to service debt. And we didn't come out of debt until about completely out of debt. I'm saying when we were completely out of debt, i.e. Michael and I got some of our loans back five years ago. That was the first time. So how long was that? What year did you buy the club? Nine? 20 years. Wow. So what is your relationship like with risk then? Because that is a big risk. Two million pounds of your money effectively into a business that was struggling. Well, it wasn't. Because Michael and I, um, we went down the garden one day, sat on a seat at the end of the garden and said, well, what do we want to do with this money? What do we want to do with it? We don't want anything. There's nothing we want. So we lived in a lovely little house, cottage. We didn't need anything. But what we did want was our football club to succeed. That's what we really wanted. So why? that wasn't a risk. You want your football club to, to, to succeed. And now here we are a few decades later. I think I'm right in saying no club has been promoted and relegated from the Premier League more times than Norwich City. So it's certainly been a roller coaster ride, right? Plenty of highs and plenty of lows. Yes. And there is now American investment on the horizon. Yes. I think I'm right in saying... No, that's yesterday confirmed, yeah. yeah. So is that an equal shareholding now? With... Yes, yes. So how does that sit with you? Um, well, it started with one of our board directors, Michael Fulger, wanting to sell his shares. And so um, we went out and found a broker to see who would want be interested in investing in a football club. And they found four different Americans. And we looked at them... We decided on one, he came over and he bought Michael Fulger's shares but also put some money in to the club as well and we had an agreement that um, he, he put a time limit. He said, well, in seven years' time, you sem sell me the club or you pay me the money back um, and that seemed like a good deal. So that was him sort of coming, you know, and then, unfortunately, COVID happened. After COVID, we got into debt again. Yeah. I mean, if, <laughs> not quite back to square one, but pretty hard, you know. So, um, in order to try and help the debt, we released some of our shares. So he's now got 40% and we've got 40%. So in that initial meeting, Delia, how, how much of it was about the finances and the way you structured that seven-year agreement and how much of it was about the values that you'd yeah. obviously bought into? Well, um, Mark Antanasio um, has um, a baseball club called the um, Milwaukee Brewers and it's more or less the same story as Norwich. You know, he took it over when it was, and then he brought it up and now they're right at the top. Um, we did a lot of homework. We did a lot of due diligence. He, they're very much community people. They believe in community. It seems like a good match. It really, really does. But I can tell you now, if it isn't, we're not going to give up our 40, share, 40 million share, whatever it is we've got. Yeah. yeah. And being vulnerable for a moment, is there, is there any fear or a sense of sadness that you're no longer the, the majority shareholder? You know, Norwich yes. has been a North Star for you yes. for so long. Definitely, yeah, definitely. But it doesn't matter because we're only there for the good of the foot, 
football club and um we feel very strongly that we've got to give it up now because of our age we have to there's no way we're going to be still so therefore um it's our passion now is to get the right the right people and so far it looks good <laughs> i'm so pleased and as a norwich city fan i hope it's the right decision <laughs> yeah i mean i can't say i'm going to miss going to boring board meetings you know <laughs> <laughs> when that ends <gasps> can we talk about the power of reading please yes you're an avid reader yes we have a high performance book club um, we always, and will at the end of this interview, ask you for just one book recommendation. But before we get to the specifics of book recommendations. One book? Yeah. Oh you, can, you can cogitate on that for a moment. What does reading do for you? It teaches. It teaches. I learn. You know, I'm passionate to learn about something. I'm, everything I can find, I'll read. And where does that come from? I don't know. I was dreadful at school. But I did really like English literature. You know, I was no good, but I did like English literature. Something about writing and um, literature was something I really came, I was gifted with, I suppose, really. Before we move to our quickfire questions, and this relates to the point you just made about untruth, um, and it relates to your freedom and the book that you recently released, which is incredible, we'd recommend it to anyone you matter, um, What's the one thing you would love people to do after listening to this conversation? I'm going to use a Damien phrase here. Look at the bigger picture. Look at the bigger picture. The world isn't right. And look at yourself and find out what you can do to help make the world a better place. And that involves other people. But everybody, there isn't anyone born who doesn't have a role, who can't add something. And if their brain automatically says to them, hey, you're just an individual in the vastness of this planet, mm -hmm. you can't have an impact, what would you say to them? Go somewhere where you can have an impact. <laughs> Join football. <laughs> Join somewhere where you're going to be with other people because other people, you can spend all day on your own dreaming. You know, that's not going to help you. But if you could be relate to other people and um, understand that they're all struggling the same way you're struggling and make a difference. And um, let's not put up with what we're putting up with. We're putting up with things and we shouldn't be. I love that. Delia, time for the quick fire questions. I know you listen to the podcast, so you've heard a few of these over the years. What are the three non-negotiable behaviours that you and ideally the people around you as well, should really buy into? Truth. Definitely that's the key to everything. Mm. Um, respect for other people, um, behaviour towards other people, um, and humility. Very good. We've covered some of this in terms of your greatest weakness, but also your biggest strength. Risk. I think, you know... The spur of the moment, okay, the brain's not engaged, but the heart is, you know, bump, do it. <laughs> That's the biggest strength. Yeah. yeah. I love that. I don't know. I think so. <laughs> I think it other is. people might be able to tell you more. Talking of other people, what is the thing that you feel people get wrong or misunderstand most about you? I might come across sometimes as being a bit of a goody, you know, and I'm not. <laughs> Ask my husband. <laughs> What advice would you give to a teenage dealer just starting out? Only one thing, and I've thought about this a lot and I've said it when I'm with young people, don't be afraid to fail. If you're not afraid to fail, you can do anything. Anything. If you're not afraid to fail, live with failure. It's not always going to work. You're not always going to be right. Can you give us an example of your biggest failure and what you learned from it? Not getting in the premiership for five years. <laughs> and why was that a failure? <laughs> because um, my ambition was to be able, Michael and I, our ambition was to be able to somehow or other do it without the money. You know, we're self-funding. Everybody's got lashings of money everywhere. 
And if we could actually achieve that, that's what my dearest wish of achievement would be. Um, and my other achievement would be to, would want to do is change politics. Delia, I've loved this conversation. I've absolutely loved it. Um, the final question is your last message really to the, to the people that have sat and listened to this. What would you love to leave ringing in their ears about living their own high performance life? Learn to love yourself and then you'll love everyone. Beautiful. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thanks.